Okay, praise God. We're going to be studying today at Job. Well, this is going to be the last chapter of Job 42, that is. Uh, since I'm using my wife's glasses, I'm sorry, I don't bring mine. She's going to get mine. So uh, it might, I might be a little bit difficult to read, but I, I think I do a good job with this one here. Okay. He's going to bring mine in a little while. So yeah, so we're going to be looking at Job chapter 42. And uh, we're going to look at the whole chapter here. Okay? And as you well know, we've been having the study of Job, right? Amen. All these uh, weeks that had passed by, but we did have one ourselves, you see, and that was the first, the first two chapters of Job. At least we got that uh, introductory. We, we, we looked into what was going on with Job and everything that, has, that was happening in the spiritual realm, you know, up there in heaven. And then what happened to Job here, down here on earth, right? We looked at that. And uh, though we're going to look into something very specific about Job and about the book that is and what God is telling us about this. And one thing we're going to look into is that we must accept the book of Job, you know, that is never interested in the question of innocent suffering in reality. Not really, you see. Uh, since we already know, or that is, we know from the start, from the outset, that Job is blameless and upright. Do you recall that, right? That we looked into, the, even, even the first chapter and the first verses, that the testimony that is given about Job is that it's a man that is blameless and upright and he fears God and shuns evil, if you recall that, right? So right from the outset, we know that Job is innocent and that Job is a, a righteous man, we might say, you see? And uh, so we, we look into that, you see? And so what we see here is what's happening with Job is that's a test that is going through. It is a test, you see. He has suffered a test here and because of his faithfulness too unto the Lord. So the book never addresses the question of why the innocent suffer. That's not addressed here. Why the, he suffers, as you would see. You see, similarly, the loss of Job's children uh, is it's understood as a necessary part of testing Job's faith, we might say, to the utmost. His faith is tested, you see, to the utmost. It's interesting, you see, because God knows of to what degree we could be tempted, tested, put to the, to the trial, or whatever. God knows a threshold in all this, right? And he knows what is with Job in this, in this thing. But as we go into the dialogues, you know, if you have been reading the book of Job, in the Bible, we see these long chapters of this dialogue in respect with Job and his three uh, friends there. And we see how, as we go into it, how his friends are trying to convict him of sin. And we see Job uh, defending himself, saying, no, that's not the case. I am not, you know, an upright sinner. I, I am a man that is upright, have been upright. I have been a man that has done, lived my life as, as a righteous man, fearing God. Yes. And the thing is that he, although his, this dialogue with his friends becomes a little bit more, uh, uh, very, you might say his friends are harassing him in a way, because they're telling Job that he has sinned against God, that confessed his sin. And then Job puts a complaint to, uh, to the Lord. And the complaint is, why am I suffering? And again, as we just stated, the book doesn't address why the innocent is suffering. Not really. You see, this is more of a test of the trial that is going through in what's going on here. So we're going to be looking first at the, at the first verse. We're going to look into that, the first verse. So we're going to go to verse 1. Okay, let me adjust these glasses here. Okay. Okay. 
Let us go to verse 1. We're going to start there. Okay, uh, anybody has it? So somebody could read verse 1, please. Anybody? Chapter 42? Yeah, chapter 42, I'm sorry. Yeah. Just verse 1? Just verse 1. Yes. Oops, I'm in Psalms. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> you in Psalms? <laughs> I was reading something there. I'm okay. Sorry. Good, good, good. Oh, good. Okay, here we go. Yes. Then Job answered the Lord and said. That's it? Yeah, okay, that's what it says. Yes, that's it. This, this, was, this was the answer Job gave to Yahweh. Very good. That's it. That's just verse 1. You see? And uh, we see here the absence of divine interrogation, meaning that God is now in not interrogating him now he's the one that's going to answer uh, Job and at this point it suggests that it's similar to Job in, in uh, chapter 30 uh, sorry chapter 40 uh, 1 through 5 if we will look into that uh, two chapters before that you see uh, it's uh, in chapter let me see 40 verses 1 then Yahweh turned to Job and he said is Shaddai's opponent willing to give in? Has God's uh, critic thought up an answer? And then it says, Job replied to Yahweh, My words are being frivolous. What can I reply? I had better lay my finger on my lips. I have spoken once, I will not speak again. More than once, I will add, add nothing. Okay, up to verse 5, right there. You see, this goes with that, if you would look into that, as he answers, as Yahweh, God, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's turning to Job, you see. And then, now here, uh, this was the answer Job gave to Yahweh, which we're going to see now, the answer that he gives to God here, you see. And uh, we see this, and we have actually part of a single and uniform response to God's appearance. Now, in order for us to be in context here, if you recall now, we are the last chapter of Job, right? But if we go back to chapter, to chapter 38, we see the theophany, meaning the appearance of God. God comes into the scene here. God is now going to speak uh, to Job, you see. And God is telling Job now to brace himself, to gird up himself like a man, and now you're going to answer me, right? And this is all directed to Job, which Job is putting a complaint before God about why is he going through this harsh trial in which he goes to. In other words, he doesn't deserve this. Right? And this is what uh, Job has before the Lord. Now, the Lord uh, God is it, uh, directing himself to, to Job. And it, from chapter 38, it is called a theophany because it's an appearance of God. God now has an appearance. You know, out of, of, of a whirlwind, you see, out of a, this little, uh, this tempest that is going on, God himself, now it's answering. You see, it's, it comes into the scene. We know we had some very long chapters of dialogue between Job and his friends. And uh, here, everything was, uh, God, we didn't see, we, we had the first chapters, we see what was going on in the heavenly realm, you see. Yeah. You see, between God and how Hasatan, remember, Hasatan is the accuser, the devil himself, Satan, you see, Hasatan. And how he's the one that, that plays uh, this thing uh, there in order for, for Job to be tried and God allow it because uh, God here is teaching us something. Remember we looked at that, that uh, in reality, you know, this is not much, this is not a wager, this is not, no, neither God get benefits from this nor the devil benefits from this, although the devil wants Job's destruction. What is benefiting is us, the readers, the ones that are here on this side. And God is letting us know about this 
uh, that is happening with Job, you see, because we don't know reality, in, and that's another thing we're going to look into, and which is going to be answered in this last chapter, that if a, a man serves God for nothing, or for no profit at all, and this is what's going to be answered by the way Job responds and how he acts afterwards in the end. We just read a little bit now uh, in uh, chapter 40 what Job says. And Job is saying here that, you know, uh, he better put his hand or his finger on his lips. He can't say nothing. He's speechless now. You see, his complaint is gone out of him. And the other uh, parts of dialogues, you know, with his friends, he's complaining. He's, you know, he's in a heated debate uh, with his friends. His friends become very, uh, let me change my glasses here. Thank you very much. Wow, I can see now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, some blue. You thank the Lord, you know, that he has given us, you know, sight. <laughs> yes. Yes, so... Uh, we see the dialogue, you know, and how he's putting this complaint before the Lord, right? And this is what you see in verse 1. That's why we're comparing it with, uh, with chapter 40, verses 1 through 5, and this answer that Job is giving to God and how Yahweh is telling Job now. Then Yahweh turned to Job and he said, Is Shaddai his opponent willing to give in? Has God's critics thought up an answer? You see, then Job replied to Yahweh, My words are being frivolous. You know, they don't, they, they're like, count like nothing. It's silly. My words have been privileged. What can I reply? I can't say anything anymore. I had better lay my finger on my lips. I have spoken once. I will not speak again. More than once, I will add nothing. That was in chapter 40, verses 1 uh, through 5. And as we contrasted with uh, chapter 42, the last chapter here, this was the answer Job gave to Yahweh here. That was the first one. So let's go to verse 2 here. Can somebody read verse 2? Chapter 42 of Job. Verse 2. The second verse only. That was chapter 42 in Job. Now you've got me in charge. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's a blessing to hear some other, some, some other part of the Bible. Hey, <laughs> Okay, so we're going to read it. My, my version says, I know that you are all powerful. What you conceive, you can perform. Okay, that's how I have it in my version here. <laughs> You see, this is what Job starts saying, right? Who, who else can read it from their version? 42, verse, uh, verse 2. What did they just read? No, that was on the house. That was Psalms. <laughs> we need Job, chapter 42, verse 2. Yes. I know that thou canst do everything. Everything. Okay. And that no thought can be withholden from thee. Okay, very good. So he's reaffirming, uh, this is a reaffirmation of faith in God's sovereign power, right? Job is reaffirming God's sovereign power. He's sovereign. He can do anything and everything he wants to do. And we see here that God has a plan too. God has a plan, see? And the world, as we see it, is not like a, you know, a place of, of random happenings or chance. For God... You see, this is not like if things happen, oh, you know, wow. You know, because we, have, we hear a lot about the things that are going on. Senseless killing, senseless here. But you know something? God has a plan. You know, it's not senseless if we, are, if we look at the perspective of the Lord in His plan and stuff. You see, it, because we all, always hear this. And it's true, you know, people are dying in a way it lo it's senseless. But yet, be God is not senseless. It's something He has a plan in all this. People are suffering. Yeah. Do you remember when Jesus, our Lord, you know, was there teaching the word, and then some were in the crowd were uh, discussing among themselves about the people that Pilate killed, you see, and mixes blood uh, with these people that were assassinated and stuff. 
And uh, so they were saying, wow, you know, these people, they die innocently, what uh, no, Pilate did, and this and that. And the Lord Jesus answered, that was in Luke chapter 13, if I'm not mistaken. And he, he said to them, you know, do you think that the, that the ones, the people that died when this tower fell upon them were more sinners than all the rest of other people? I tell you not, he says. But if you do not repent, you shall perish likewise. You see, and whatever Pilate did with all, all these people that were killed or whatever, were they more sinners than anybody else? Not. Of course not. But if you do not repent, you shall perish likewise. Amen. So the thing is not whether, you know, people are dying randomly and senseless. The thing is, are we prepared when that time comes? Uh, is our heart prepared for the Lord? Have we been living a, a, a life in which we could say, you know, if that person uh, is taken out of this world, it's going to be with the Lord, it's going to be with God? Have some evidence of faith in those persons that died you know, as knowing the Lord Jesus in their life, and we for sure, we know that they have, are going to heaven with the Lord, you see? That's the thing. Are we prepared? The thing is, many people are living lives, for example, many have lived lives, they, they die at 50 years old. Maybe some have died at 40. Maybe some have died 60 or 70. You see, oh, what a terrible loss. You know, a human being, of course, dies. But they have had a long way of life of coming to repentance, of opportunities that God has given that person of knowing God. Because in reality, no one is going to be excused from the Lord because I never knew. I didn't know about the gospel. I didn't know about the plan of salvation. Everybody has had an opportunity, especially here in this country, in which the gospel is being preached everywhere, you see. So nobody is going to be exempt before the Lord. Nobody is going to have a a valid excuse before God, you know, oh, I didn't know, Lord. You know, maybe they have lived 50 years, 60 years, and something happens, you know, along the road in life in which they die, whether it be by an accident, a, a car accident, or whether it be something very bad, maybe they have been mugged or whatever, and, you know, that they could be assaulted, and they, they, their t lives could be taken away, but were they prepared for that day when death came, you see? So it's all about knowing that, you know, the gospel is there for us to understand that there's life in Jesus Christ. It, you know, uh, uh, the, this news that really touched me, and I know it have touched many of you, is about this young man who forgave that lady that yeah, killed yeah. his brother, right? Yeah. And the forgiveness Amen. is a tremendous thing because this young man, you know, was different from everybody else That's in right. that sense. He just forgave her, you know, and he said... And the best thing that you could do is give your life to Christ. Amen. He was a believer. And, and he says, is my brother, you know, Button, I think his name was, yes, Jim Button, uh, was here, he would have liked for you to do that, of all things. That's a true act of forgiveness there, you see, Amen. that sense of reconciliation, especially with all these tensions that are going on with racist stuff or whatever. You know, we see here, you know, there is the love of Christ Amen. there. For people to understand and know, you know, that there is hope in the gospel. And the judge spoke of her and handed her a Bible too. Oh and yes, there's that's there's something. That. Yeah, that's something tremendously. That the judge, yeah. she, she was a Christian woman. Yeah. Praise the Lord, she that she, that she gave a Bible to her and gave her some words too. Right. It's a tremendous thing, you see. We as Christians, we see this. That is, again, was this. It looked like it was a senseless act of this young man's life being killed by this woman who was negligent. In reality, she was negligent in doing what she did, you see. But yet, we see now that there's a purpose, a plan. Now, the devil wants to, you know, go against this, as saying, let's reprimand the judge for doing this. You know, oh, he shouldn't have done, the, the, this young man should have done that, you know, against his family's uh, wishes or whatever. The devil is going to come against that, you see. But yet we see how God works in respect to forgiveness, in respect of unifying, in respect of this, this woman being restored, rehabilitated. That's right. The enemy meant it for bad. God is doing it, you know, for good. And then it also says in Romans 8, all things work together for good for those that love the Lord and yes. are called according to Yes, that's right. Because what that guy mm -hmm. did was show his purpose in Christ. 
That's right. And his purpose is to forgive and to restore, yes. not to destroy. That young man was a Christian, the one that was yeah, killed. He was a Christian, so fulfilled. we know he was ready. In other words, when he was killed, he was taken into God's presence. Praise the Lord. He's with the Lord. He's with God. Yet, we see a purpose here. So it was, a senseless, it was not a senseless killing here. It was the Lord who has done something tremendous here, especially by the testimony and the act of this young man that forgave him, because that got the attention of many people tremendously. So... This is what we see here. Job says, I know that you are all powerful. What you can see, if you can perform, he has a plan and things to do. So the world is not just a, a, a place of happenings and random chance of things that happen to people. It happens, but as we look at the picture better on, on this perfe perspective, that is the, the, the Lord's perspective here, we see that God has plans in all this. The innocent is suffering. The questions that I address about that the trial is there. The thing is, are we going to be serving God for no profit? Are we going to serve God for nothing? As, as it is, uh, you know, as the accuser, as, as Satan, you know, wants uh, us to know that, you know, you know, for us to serve God, there's some kind of uh, gain to it. <laughs> no, Job is serving the Lord because, you know, as we could see in his answer, he really loves God in this sense. Let's look at, well... Uh, the suffering that Job experienced falls within the divine purpose of God. <laughs> That's what we see, as we just mentioned, things that are happening here in the world. The test regarding the willingness of any human to fear God, here to fear God without profit. This is the test. Uh, so a, a person can serve God and fear God for no profit at all. Even if you don't live in prosperity. We're going to see that Job is prosper, right? Afterwards, God blesses him. But Job wasn't aware that he was going to get that reward. He didn't care whether, you know, he, God blessed him. He just now understood, after what we see here, and as he repents, you know, that he has spoken foolishly. That he, uh, you know, put this complaint before God because he had lack of understanding and knowledge in respect to how God works, you see. And the comparison is of the greatness of and as Job says, you are sovereign. In everything that you do, you are sovereign. You know all. So humans can continue to fear God for no profit, even when the profit is no more than holy recognition. You could be recognized, you know, and, and, and that's it. But, you know, if you don't have no profit in material things or prosperous things, you could still fear God and serve Him. That's the thing, you see. So we could do that. Now, uh, let me see, let's look at verse 3. Let's, let's read. Somebody read, read verse 3 first. Okay, that's it, right? Very good. I am the man who obscure your designs with my empty-headed words. I got it here in this uh, uh, version. And then you read uh, that version. Yeah. Somebody else has a different thing, or how does it? Yeah, yeah go ahead. What, what do you read? Uh, my thing is, you ask, who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Okay. Surely I spoke of things I do not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. Okay, good. I have been holding forth on matters I cannot understand, on marvels beyond me and my knowledge. Yeah. They all say the same thing, as you could see, right? Yeah. Because the Bible. Uh, you know, different versions just giving us a better perspective of understanding or looking at things in different versions. But it's the same thing. God is saying the same thing through His Word here. You see, and here, uh, when He says here, uh, for, uh, here it says, "I am the man who obscure your designs with my empty-headed words." It's talking about make dark something that is being made obscure, conceal, hide. This is the way in which Job was speaking what's talking in his words before that. Because remember, we've got to go to his dialogues, uh, 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 chapters before that, which we're talking about from chapter 3 all the way uh, to chapter 38. Because in chapter 38, that's when, in chapter 8, that's when God, the theophany, the appearance of God, comes into the scene. Now, we do have, if you recall, from chapter 32 to chapter 38, a dialogue of a, uh, another person 
that is not part of Job's friend. His name is Elihu, right? You recall that, right? It's good for you to start reading the book of Job and it's the complete thing so you could un be familiar to what's going on, what's happening. So Elihu com comes into the scene uh, here in chapter 32. He takes a few chapters and now Elihu is the one that is reprimanding Job and the friends of Job and exalting the Lord. It's interesting because we might say he, he's here as an introductory to when God comes into the scene and appears. So Elihu is speaking the things that need to be spoken in order to let Job that his complaint is not valid before the Lord and in order, in order to let his friends know that they are not talking the right stuff. They're not saying the right thing before the Lord. You see, that's Elihu here in chapter 32 to uh, uh, chapter 38. You see, I'm going to look at this. Yeah. So, this, uh, for example, this here links to, to the theophany here in verse 2 of chapter 38, uh, which is linked to this response. Let me just read that verse in chapter 38, verse 2, when God starts speaking. And God, in verses 2 of 38, says, Who, who is this obscuring my designs with his empty-headed words? You see, God says this when he starts speaking. And now Job here is replying, I am the one. I am the one that's speaking nonsense, who might say. Uh, he finds out now, after seeing God's power and sovereignty, and sovereignty, that his words don't have the effect of vindication that he wants. He wants to be, he wants to be vindicated for being a righteous man. But, you know, God ultimately is the one that places this upon whoever it is. You see, again, as we could see, uh, we could learn from Job here his lack of understanding of God. It's true he was a man that was blameless and upright, fears God, and shuns evil. You see, it is true. But that's not in respect to having that merit, you see, so that he could uh, say, well, you Lord, God, you know, because I'm here, you know, this ain't supposed to happen to me as an innocent man. God has placed him in a trial. All he has to do is trust the Lord. All we have to do is trust the Lord. If we go through a trial, a real hard trial, and we have been good doing stuff, all we have to do is trust the Lord. God knows, ultimately, the end of this. That the end is to give glory to Him. Ultimately, you see. And if God chooses... To bless us, good. If he doesn't choose us to prosper us materially, good too. Praise the Lord. We're still going to serve him. And that was the trial that was placed uh, before uh, us. We might say the, the, the readers, you see, that if we're going to be serving God for no profit at all. You see. We live our lives. Our purpose to live our lives is to serve God above all things. Not to be wealthy or to have a healthy, long life here on this earth. And God is out of the picture. We cannot do that. You see. Or maybe some want to have both. You see. But yet the Lord says. You cannot serve two masters. You see. Because you will clinch to one. And despise the other. That's what Jesus said. So either we serve God. Or we serve mammon. And the best thing to do is to serve the Lord. It is the way, the truth, and life. Even if we don't have the prosperous material things of this world. You see. We have God our Lord. Because we know ultimately that we have life everlasting. Jesus Christ has given it to us. Yes. He said it himself. You know, him who believes in me shall not die. And him who believes in me shall have life, everlasting life. Amen. In Lord Jesus Christ. You see. So we see that the appearance of God in chapter 38 through 41 has supplied the knowledge necessary for a new and deeper understanding. Uh, Job now, in, uh, at the end here, now he has a better perspective of God in this thing. He doesn't understand yet all oh, because remember, our minds as human beings, is, we're puny. Amen. Our minds, our perspective is limited, you see. It's uh, finite. God is tremendously, you know, great and powerful. We cannot, our little minds cannot comprehend everything about God. But yet, as we go into the Word of God through faith, we can come to understand and comprehend some things to the Lord by faith and through faith in what has God has placed for us. Uh, the Lord 
uh, said to Moses, as Moses said to the people of Israel, that the things that have been uh, manifested, you know, that's for us to know. For the things that have been obscured by God, we don't have to worry about it. You see, because so God has, what has God is about wrong. in the world is too wonderful for any human to know, even, even by direct experience. You see, it's too wonderful. God is all too powerful. If you will recall in the chapters of the Theophany, meaning of the of when God appeared, when Yahweh starts speaking to Job, uh, the thing that God spoke to Job is in respect to his creation, his power over creation, how he sustains everything in creation. You know, he speaks about animals, you know, out there, uh, and different habitats in, w in which they, they live, and how God has given each of these beasts, of these creatures, its wisdom to survive, its, its way for them to, you know, to, to live, and, and for them to be supplied by the Almighty, by God Himself. He takes care of all that. You know, and then about the creation, about the world, the cosmic uh, constellations, you know, out there and everything else that Haggad has done. So it's something way, way, way out of our minds as human beings. And this is what Job was finding out now, you know, how small we are in comparison to God's knowledge. Remember, Job wants a debate even with the Lord, with God, about his predicament, about what's going on with him. Let's look, for example, let's look at verse 4 here. Look at, who can read verse 4 of chapter 42 of Job? I'll read it. Go ahead. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Okay. Yes. Listen, I have more to say. Now it is my turn to ask questions and yours to inform me. Uh, it's tremendous because this goes back to Job's statement in chapter 13, verse 22. Okay. Uh, let me just read that verse of chapter 13 of Job, verse 22. That's when he, he was, you know, starting his argument, his dilemma with the Lord God. And it says here in verse 22, basically almost the same, when he reads, Then arraign me, and I will reply, or rather I will speak, and you shall answer me. This is Job speaking about saying, I want to speak with God. Like, I want to have a courtroom setting, a date, Okay, arraign me, put the charges against me, and then I'm going to answer. I'm going to speak. I'm going to put my defense before you, God. Here, now, he's acknowledging that he cannot say anything. That he, in reality, he cannot defend himself. There is no kind of lawyer that could really uh, come to defend him in this matter here, before the Lord God Almighty, you see. So now, he can't even say anything more. Listen, I have more to say. Now it's my turn to ask questions and yours to inform me. This is God now speaking to him in respect to all this. He's just repeating, you know, what the Lord now is telling him about this, you see. Now, let's look at, uh, as we looked into this, you know, uh, now he has direct experience of the Creator. Remember, God has just spoken. Now he has this uh, direct experience. His former knowledge of God, you know, approach. Uh, on some satiated hearsay, only by what I heard, things that, you know, uh, more like gossip, you might say. I knew of things of you, but more like gossip, not real substantiated things. They were unsubstantiated. So, God is sovereign and just. He has this knowledge now of God, after the Lord finished, you know, speaking. God is concerned with all creation. Remember, God spoke to him about his creation, everything in the world, not just humanity, all creation. God's purposes and plans for humanity and the world are often mysterious and beyond our human uh, knowledge, beyond our human knowing. That's way beyond his plans. It's tremendous in all this. Let's look at uh, verse 5 in respect to that. My ear had heard of you but now my eyes have seen you. Okay, there it is, you see? He has this knowledge of God now. Why? Because remember, God has just spoken in the verses preceding, I mean in the chapters preceding this. God has just spoken. You see, because remember, in Job, when God starts speaking, in Job 38, verse uh, 3, part B of that verse, 38B, this is the Lord when he starts speaking to Job, 3B, 
he says, now it is my turn to ask questions and yours to inform me. This is God speaking to Job, right? This is God speaking to Job, you see, and this is God's initial confrontation to Job. We just read chapter 13, verse 22, when Job wanted to answer God and wanted to be on the platform in the courtroom for him to defend himself. You see, now God says, now it's your turn. Let's see what you're going to say. And he can't say nothing now. After acknowledging God's sovereign power, after acknowledging who he is, how he creates everything, you know, now he can't say anything. You see? So this is what we see. Uh, we see that this, is, this statement anticipates Job's earlier inability to instruct God concerning uh, the operation of creation. <laughs> uh, you know, it's good to go into those chapters and delve into it and you understand how great and sovereign is God in respect to creation. You see, Job is ready to admit his limited understanding and the futility of his demand that God replies to his complaint in reality. You know, how can God, you know, reply, reply to this complaint? Now he sees that his complaint is nothing compared to his sovereign power, to God's sovereign power. Uh, let's look at verse 6. Verse 6, somebody can read verse 6. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Okay. Here we see now Job's confession, right? After he acknowledges all this before the Lord, now he says that he repents. My version says, I retract all I have said. And in dust and ashes, I repent. Job says this, you see. The word retract here, in my version that I have, which is more uh, with the original, the Hebrew here, retract, that is Job is withdrawing some earlier statements or understanding that he wants to correct in light of his new experience. This new experience was what the theophany, the new experience in which God appeared and starts, you know, letting Job tell him, now answer me. You know, have you know about this? Have you done this? Tell me. Remember we, uh, I, I don't know, no, I, I had this uh, study afterwards uh, somewhere else, uh, in which God, in which uh, God tells Job, you see, can you, you know, put down the haughty or the proud man? You know, can you really uh, go ahead and shut them down, right. you see, uh, in the things that they do? Can you do this? If you could do this, God says, then I could tell you, you know, that you could save yourself by your own arm. Otherwise, you cannot do it, you see. And so we see here now, you know, how powerful God is. And Job, in this new experience of how God is speaking to him now, he has better understanding now. In other words, he was ignorant, very ignorant. He had this lack of knowledge of God. He was going through a trial, true, you see. But all he needed to do, as we are learning, as we learn too, because, you know, we, could, we fall in the same predicament as Job, you know, as our you know, weak minds that we have as human beings, is to trust God with our trials, to trust the Lord. Although we see, we see it kind of senseless, you see, yet God has a purpose. It is not senseless. When we look into God's perspective, God has a purpose, yes. you mm -hmm. see, in all this. So he retracts. In other words, he's uh, correcting uh, his uh, statements that he did before. He repents of that that he has said before, you see. What Job, what Job changes his mind about is uh, his desire for personal vindication. Because remember, he wants to be vindicated before the Lord as a righteous man. Now, he's not looking to be vindicated before the Lord. We cannot be vindicated. Only God does that at his will, wherever he has, wherever he, he wants, you see. That's why God says, I have mercy. On whom I, have, I want to have mercy? Ultimately, it's God the one that makes the decision on whom he's going to have mercy, for whom he's going to do what needs to be done. Do you remember Abraham? Abraham was considered... Uh, uh, righteous uh, before the Lord because he believed God. Not because of the things that he had done, simply because of faith in the Lord. Yes. Not of works that he had done, right. you yes. see. And he was justified, says the word of God, even before uh, he was circumcised. Yes. And that was one of the things that was very uh, big yes. with, in the time of our Lord Jesus, the Pharisees. 
they thought that they were justified before God because of the works, of the good deeds, of the righteous people that they were before the Lord. And because they were part of the circumcision of what the covenant that God made with Abraham. And through the Holy Spirit, Paul spoke uh, to them, you know, reprimanding them and rebuking them and letting them know that Abraham was justified, you know, not because of circumcision or because of the works, but because he believed God, simple and plain. Amen. And this is what we have to do when we go through these trials, in which it's hard for us to follow, to, you know, be into, trust God. Amen. Just, he's, he has a plan for us in all this. You see, we cannot see it, but He has it for us. You see, so uh, His new understanding of God practically, practically obliterates, you see, any need for a public declaration of innocence. He, he obliterates that uh, for Job now. Now He doesn't want to uh, be counted as innocent here, no. He chose now see a new light in God, in the Lord. He's the one that's going to do it. If He wants to do it, of course, all we have to do is just trust in Him. God is, you know, has. Uh, this plan here for us. Let's go to verse 7 here. After the Lord has said these things to Job, he said to Elphaz and to Tabernacle, I am angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. Okay. Praise the Lord. Now, Job finishes. He's repenting. In uh, dust and ashes, which is a sign of true uh, of mourning and repentance. So uh, this is something truthful. He's put it into practice here, Job, as he does this, and now uh, he's giving us a narration about Yahweh, about God. And here now he says that uh, Yahweh it's a turn to Eliphaz or maybe Eliphaz of Timan. You see, the Timanite that is. You see, and he's burned with anger against, uh, I burn with anger against you and your two friends, you see. Okay, uh, we're going to look at the, uh, a few things here, you see. Uh, it answers the foundational uh, question of the Satan, or the Hasatan, the accuser, whether humans can fear God without profit. Uh, we're going to see that it's answering this. Now, by the action of Job of repenting in dust and ashes, you see, and retracting to what he has said before of trying to vindicate himself before the Lord, you see. Uh, so it answers that, and when he retracts his desire for vindication at the end of this verse 6 that we just mentioned here, it answers that, you see, and then God's decision to restore the, the fortunes of Job, because God is going to restore the portions of Job, uh, not, need not be related in a cause and effect way. In a cause and effect way, be, in other words, uh, because Job repented, then God blessed him. That's not the way it goes. You see, God did not bless or prosper Job because he repented. You see, not because of that in reality. God is the one that is doing it. Now, Job needed to repent and understand, you see, what needed to be done. So it wasn't because of the merit of repentance that he gets this. No, God has a plan for Job. And Job, and we see already that Job wants to keep serving God. He's a servant of God. God says he's my servant. He wants to keep serving God, you know, in spite of all these losses. Right now, Job finds himself, you know, without anything. He has a disease on him. He's complaining before God, but now he has a better perspective of God. He's not complaining anymore. He's retracting from the things he has said before, and he's repenting. And he doesn't know whether you know he's going to keep on living now in poverty. He doesn't know whether he's going to keep on living. You see, with this disease, and ha just have to deal with it the rest of his life. He doesn't know that. He's willing to live that way oh. and keep trusting in the Lord. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. So God is the one that ultimately has the decision yeah. either to give him that or not. Wow. If God doesn't give it to him, yet Job is still going to be trusting in the Lord. Yeah. That should be our mindset as Christians. Because we know that this world is not our reward here in this world. Amen. Our reward is what God has in everlasting life Glory. afterwards. Hallelujah. Yes. All we do is just serve God and live for God. In spite of the circumstances how we live, you see. And keep ourselves be fear, fearing God, you know, 
fearing ourselves, I mean fearing God and uh, shunning evil. We have to do by following His word here. That's what we need to do. So we see that, you see here, so it's not in a cause and effect way because some people think that by you doing this, then you're going to be blessed by this. Not yeah. really. That doesn't, well, God doesn't work that way. It's not you by see. Works. That's right. It's not by works. You see. And that's what happens with you know, so many Christians too. Mm -hmm. they, they got this, uh, you know, uh, thinking that, you know, if I do this, no. then God is going to bless me like this. Yeah. That doesn't happen. You see, God is going to, God has a blessing for you already. Oh, you got to trust in the Lord, you know. Oh, you got to trust in the Lord. God is a free agent whose activities are beyond human control and influence. We cannot influence God, you see. For Him to be good to us, we cannot. We cannot even gain points with the Lord. That doesn't work that way, like that either. See, and uh, we, as we can see, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. That's what Job said, remember, when at the beginning of his trial, you see. And it's uh, equally true in reverse. In other words, as the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away, and uh, now we could see that as the Lord has taken away, now He could give back too. God does it. It's all on the Lord. The Lord is the one who's got to trust in Him, in the Lord. And third, the restoration of Job's circumstances relates closely to the nature of Job's loss and suffering as a test. This was a test for Job, you see. So, as we mentioned something about Abraham, remember Abraham's son, Isaac, you see? He was... As Abraham passes the test, his son was restored to him. You see, God asked Abraham, give your son to me as a sacrifice. And Abraham went ahead obeying God to the utmost. He was hard in his heart. He was feeling it. We had this uh, study of the Akedah, if you remember, the vine. As uh, you know, the Jews call it the Akedah, the vine in which, you know, that is that Abraham ties his son to be a, a sacrifice, a burnt sacrifice unto the Lord because God asked it. And he followed it through to the end, mm -hmm. you see. And what, what was the outcome of that? That God restored his son back to him, yes. yeah. you see. So yeah. the restoration of Job's family and possessions are part of the test story formula here. Yeah. As we could see that, as we read, read the other uh, verses that we go into. So this phrase... When Yahweh has said all this to Job, connects back to the formula that introduced the theophany. If you will go, the, when we speak about theophany, we're talking about the appearance of God in chapter 38. When God starts speaking to Job there, when he appears. Uh, for example, when he says, Then from the, from the hearts of the tempest, Yahweh gave Job his answer. And it, it, that links back here, when Yahweh has said all these things to Job, you know, it goes back to here now, as what Yahweh is going to do here, in, in reference to this. El, uh, Eliphaz, Eliphaz could be Eliphaz, or Eliphaz, the Timonite, as the representative of the group. Why? Because God addresses specifically to him. Like he's the ringleader of his two, of his two friends here. He's the main one. That's why God, uh, I guess, directs his especially it's a uh, rebuke to, to Eliphaz and again his two friends yeah. the other two are called friends the other two ones you see of, of Eliphaz and not Job you know so they're not called friends of Job here you know revealing you know the evaluation of hostility that was against Job you know this they were not speaking the correct things the right things to Job they were not speaking what God really wanted them to say to Job you see, their comments to Job were very, uh, uh, very negative, you know, and they were harassing Job in all this, you see. So God does not include, remember, Elihu? Elihu came into the scene in chapter 32 to, until the Theophany came, which God came, you know, in 38. And God does not include Elihu here, you see, in this divine rebuke, meaning that Elihu in, re in reality was not speaking the, the, the wrong things. Elihu was speaking the correct things. He was rebuking the friends, and he was rebuking Job for putting this complaint before God. Amen. You see, and the term right in the Hebrew is nekona, meaning established as correct. Not uh, sadik, which will come as Yahweh said kenu or sadik, which is righteous, but established as correct here. So they have not spoken the things that were established as, as correct. You know, before God, uh, to Job. So, 
We must always be careful how we use the words of the friends of Job in this context. Why? Because God has evaluated his words in this dialogue and have placed the verdict that they have been wanting. Meaning they have not spoken the correct things before the Lord. So we could get nuggets, you know, from the book of Job, of these dialogues, of what their uh, friends were saying, but we must be discernful and correctly use it, because God says they have not spoken the right things before the Lord. Because there are nuggets there, you see. But we must put them in context, correctly. How it must be used, you see. So, God affirms Job's words, but he never validates Job's claims of righteousness. You see, that, this is what we see here. God is not validating Job, uh, you know, words of, righteous, of, of righteousness. Because Job was speaking out of ignorance in all this. Let's go to verse 8. So now, take seven bulls and seven rams, and go to my servant Job. And sacrifice a burnt offering for yourself. My servant, Job, will pray for you, and I will accept his prayer and not deal with you according to your holy. You have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Amen. I like the way you read it because it's very clear. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you can really understand it. Yeah. yeah that's right. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Yes, seven bulls and seven rams. An incredibly, incredibly expensive sacrifice. Uh, uh, expensive sacrifice that only the wealthy could afford to offer. Okay. So this is something that they had needed to do. I think we ra ran out of uh, time here uh, for us today. But uh, so you could uh, keep on looking into this. This was what needed to be the burnt offering of the Ola. Ola offering in the Hebrew in respect to sin offering. Because they have sinned against God, they were acting folly, what they say, and the folly here is similar to the foolish that speaks, for example, in Psalm 14, 1, it says, the foolish says in his heart, there is no God. This is how these friends of Job were acting, as people that were foolish, that did not want to really acknowledge the true uh, right things that God needed them to do and this is in reference to uh, for example the seven bulls and the seven rams Ezekiel 45 in the restored temple which, which is purified this is the way it's supposed to be uh, done in this uh, perfection of sacrifice and Numbers 23 1, 4 and 29 in respect to the seven bulls that uh, Balaam wa told uh, Balak to start sacrificing to curse Israel but instead it was a blessing unto them so this is part of this in a way which these seven bulls and seven rams that they needed to do to be forgiven of the sins. And then the one whom they were condemning of a sinner was the one that's going to pray for them, intercede for them, for them to be forgiven. That's another tremendous thing how God does. And as you see afterwards, you see how God, Yahweh, restores Job's fortunes. You see, and we see the blessings of that. Just read the end of chapter 42 so you can see the end and praise God for this. Well, praise the Lord. Uh, we're going to end with a prayer. Okay. Sister Flo, can you end us with a prayer? Heavenly Father, we just thank you once more again, Lord God. Thank you for your word that came forth to remind us that you're in control, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, that we'll continue to, throughout this day, realize that you are God and God all by yourself. Lord, we pray for the service, that the word that comes forth will come forth with power, and that when we walk away from this place, healing will take place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless y'all. Gloria a Dios.